Well, so the first thing is, and I'm sure you know this, but people are often floored by this fact, which is that, so mining is one of the least digitized largest industries in the world. And, and that's because we're in a hard to do tech space. We're very high barriers to entry. The evidence of that is that today, um, less than about 3% of the world's mining trucks are actually automated and, and none of the other major assets are automated. Um, so uh, that's excluding tele remote in the underground. Right. So what that's telling you is that technology is hard in mining and moves slowly, which means that then that the quality of data and measurement in mining is surprisingly little or low. Uh, a lot of people are stunned to understand just how, what the, the, the whereas in a, say, a manufacturing facility or a processing facility, which has SCADA data in a manufacturing facility where you're timing everything, Mining, the measurability of processes in mining is still relatively low compared to other industries. And this is something that McKinsey picks up on both of these things and, and point to like an 18% productivity improvement coming from data. Um, and given the industry still at that low level of digitization, the opportunities remain large. So, and what we're seeing at the moment is that we're seeing a new generation of people coming through the sector who are data native and 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 are expecting to, to be able to measure their processes. You've got majors, and this is something that's not being talked about as well. Majors dropping down the food chain now, and and yeah, that's a first hand experience. They are coming in earlier and earlier and earlier, and they're not getting the credit that they probably deserve at this stage. That actually they are offering a helping hand. You've seen, um, for instance, played in one and Glencore in in, in twenty twenty three. That's that's one of many. Um, but I, we need discoveries. Everyone knows we need discoveries and everyone's talking about how do we finance them. Well, I've just mentioned all mechanisms that haven't been available for probably the last 10 or 12 years that are now available. But none of those other mechanisms have gone. They're still there. They still exist. So what an amazing point in time for an industry to sit at that, it, that it's seeing different mechanisms for funding available to it Yet you're seeing sentiment not picking up on that. And, and I do think that's possibly linked to, to, to how long and how deep the trough's been. But but now yeah, the sun's starting to shine, guys. And, and it genuinely is starting to shine. And we've got clear evidence is starting to shine. And with the discoveries we need, yeah, personally, I'd, I'd love to see an industry adopt a phrase of like not afraid to fail. Um, something along those lines. A bit, a bit corny. But... We've got, uh, 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 we've had a market that, has, that, as you've alluded to, has used any news of the liquidity event. So it doesn't matter what the business puts out, the share price comes down. I personally wasn't prepared to feed that. Um, we're super confident on the assets that we've got within the business. That's why you've seen us not deal. We're not, we're not a deal um orientated business to us aspect of that uh, the, the comment you made is very right the the um, differences between uh, juniors and majors uh, and the gap became bigger and bigger through through the years especially when there is a, a huge uh, uh, gap on investment uh, um the companies uh, the, the juniors uh, are uh, uh, forced to to do uh, work uh, to raise the capital uh, rather than to do the right work that needs to be done to make a discovery. And, uh, and that uh, hasn't uh, um, really supported and provided uh, the, the right investment uh, to bring forward uh, new and, and potentially um, unlocking uh, uh, geological concept and exploration concept. The ultimate uh, effect has been that uh, the discovery rate, uh, especially in copper, uh, has uh, dropped down quite significantly in the past 20 years with not significant uh, new discovery, new uh, uh, large mines, large discoveries that happening. And, uh, and also the scarcity of capital uh, and a time where we need the more resources uh, that are uh, harder to, to explore uh, and in a more difficult jurisdiction uh, has not allowed really the juniors uh, to bring forward the exploration that needs to be brought forward. 
and, and mainly the system where the junior do exploration and then the, the major come in uh, and buy in or provide the capital uh, is really broken. What the Explore program offer, uh, it offer to, to fill this gap uh, in twofold. Uh, the fold number one is uh, to provide uh, the capital uh, to the juniors uh, that uh, they don't have now to go and raise a fund and do activity to raise fund. So now they are doing the activity they need to do to do exploration. We need to transform it ourselves. So we raise money with investors. We built our own capacity. And that's what today the, the customers like. It's the fact we have developed the whole process. We're not reinventing the wheel. It's just they know the product they want. The process is not very complicated, but we develop our own expertise to do it internally by hiring people in Asia and doing, do, doing the right process. So now we're at the step where we don't need much uh, partner uh, in the anode space and we can directly sell to, uh, to OEMs and sell maker without any intermediary. So we, we can be uh, like successful as much as new uh, as BT, BTR new material is successful in China. So we have this advantage of having the two largest and most advanced graphite deposit in North America with the Matawini mine and the Lac Guerre uh, Watnan project we acquired recently. So if you want to come in North America, you need to own your deposit and, and build a pro. So now we're very well organized and very well positioned to take the most market share possible in a very, uh, and very important market for our, the future of the CV transition. It really opened, kind of opened my eyes to the, you know, we all remember Indonesian nickel and, um, and the technology changes that created that. I think uh, it opens my eyes to you know, really what the opportunity might be for us in terms of uh, this deposit's kind of unique in a good way of you would look at it and I think it was classified historically as a hard rock deposit because that's how the mineralization is hosted. But I think it's more important how you leach it and how you process it. And similar to Indonesia in, in the sense of what the what the upside could be for us. I think uh, that, that was my big takeaway from the trip of just trying to always be on the lookout for what's coming and, uh, and not to uh, discount things um, just from kind of a historical mindset of what might be possible. As I've grown into this industry, I mean, it's it's it certainly looks and appears as if rares can can kind of be a, be a bellwether for or an ind indicator of what's going on with China macro. Um, you could you could kind of see uh, rare earth prices are off fifty percent year on year. I think rare earth equities have been off about forty five percent. Um, the last few weeks, we've seen new demand prices tick back up above $50 a kilo, where they had fallen down below $48, $46 a kilo. So starting to see a, a little bit of recovery. I'd say it's not too dissimilar from uh, lithium, uh, cobalt, copper, nickel, um, where you're starting to see a little bit of recovery in copper um, these past few weeks. And, and um, it's it's undoubtedly uh, linked to to macroeconomic factors and, and starting to see some signs of encouragement. So again, um, a level of, of governmental involvement in the sector that, that we hadn't traditionally seen. Another really interesting player is OEMs. Uh, so, you know, the idea that you would have um, automotive players coming and directly investing in, in mining is, is really extraordinary. But we've seen very high profile deals, um, GM uh, in Thacker Pass in the US, and then a number of other um, of the aborted ACG acquisitions deal that had Volkswagen and Stellantis um, involved as investors in, in the project. So um, again, really novel players, Rob. So when you and I probably first got involved in this sector, we wouldn't have expected to see you know car manufacturers coming in as players on on these deals, but that's where we are. Um, and then I think another interesting um, I know you have a, a a fondness for Australia, and you know Australia has got an interesting phenomenon as well. They're determined not to allow Australian assets to to be taken into foreign ownership. And so we've seen some really interesting deals with local champions um, like Hancock Prospecting em em emerging to invest in, in uh, key Aussie assets. I would say a lot of these are not necessarily consequences. They're trade-offs that we would have to be willing to do to get to that net zero by 2050. And I think, again, our Not So Fast campaign is saying that realistically, we don't believe we can get there anyway because of the slow pace it'll take. And I'll talk about it a little later, but another big issue of that is permitting. You know, to mine these critical minerals, we know 
how long it takes to permit something here in the US, it's 10 to 12 to 13 years just to get the permit to do these. So to say we can get there by, you know, 2035, 50% reduction, then zero by 2050 is a stretch in our belief. And we think Americans should know that before they're making some of these decisions. If you, if you look at coal today, you know, far as electricity generation, it is 35% of global energy today, as we said here. So in the U.S., you know, coal has fallen to it, whether it's 20 to 22% of the generation here. And there's reasons for that. Obviously, we've lost some market share to natural gas, you know, which today is, you know, below $2 in MCF, which plays a big effect on that. But when you look at, at what we do here, so we are retiring base load generation faster then we're bringing on replacement generation. Yeah, it's a really good question, Rob. And at the moment, we are really focusing on the essentials of what the organisation can offer because that's unfortunately where our funding situation is. So all of our funding is comes from charitable donations, which um, comes essentially from mining companies and you know any other organisation that wants to donate to our charity. So those funds um, are not as um, forthcoming as, as one would expect. So some of those companies that we've worked with in the past um, that have worked excellently with us have been providing ongoing donations um, and we're very, very grateful for those. Um, but, you know, in such an amazing, strong industry that supports, you know, Australia, we'd love to see mining companies routinely donating to Miners Promise to ensure that, um, you know, the basics are covered uh, when these tragedies occur. Lots of those things we want to do in the proactive space. Um, supporting the org, uh, organisations and supporting the industry uh, in general as opposed to responding to an event. We want to try and work in the space to, you know, support and prevent those, um, but that's limiting us at the moment. So the sheer volume uh, that we've had to uh, work across over the last 18 months, so the, the 12 that we've responded to, um, we're at absolute maximum capacity at the moment. And um, that is the front and centre focus for the um, board um, at Miners Promise and the organisation as a whole is to secure ongoing sustainable funding to make sure we can continue. And then obviously the, the old issues which haven't gone away on, on mine health and safety. And I think mining companies are much more very, very conscious of, of the importance of health and safety and avoiding fatalities. So um, I, I think the, there is, uh, you know, the, there's been, obviously black letter law is still very important for mining, uh, but you have all these other issues which are, which are now coming into the, into the equation. Um, and then, you know, clearly um, all the pressure around net zero is creating its own issues for the industry. So I, I you know, I think that, that one's really seen a, a real sea change in mineral regulation in the last 20 years. And some countries are, are, are much better at doing it than others. But what I what, what, what one's seeing, interestingly, in Africa is, uh, and obviously the World Bank gets involved in, in, in some of this work as well, which is commendable, I think, um, is that when one country uh, develops a new mineral regime, other countries in the region will often follow uh, a particular lead. So that's that's another thing that one sees.